Hi, and thank you for watching. Today I would like to share something amazing with you that further confirms some of the information I have shared with you in previous videos, and I was just blown away by what our Heavenly Father showed me over the past week. You will recall that I made a video a little while ago about the legal case against our enemy, Satan, who has entered God's harvest before the time appointed for him to do so. If you have not seen this video yet, I would highly recommend it, as it would seem this is another mystery that our Heavenly Father kept hidden until now, and only wanted His people to know about in the very last days before the start of the tribulation. To give a quick summary for those who have not yet watched the video, the Word of God shows us that it is our Heavenly Father's will for all to come to salvation and to the knowledge of the truth, and that the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for our sins does not only pay for the sins of those that believe in Him, but it washes away the sins of the whole world. This is explained to us in the following passages. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If it is God's will to reconcile all things unto himself, in other words, all of his creation, and if Jesus' blood cleanses not only the sins of those who believe in him, but also the sins of the whole world, do you think that our Heavenly Father would be content if His will in this regard is not executed? Think about God's will and what the Word of God says in these passages regarding His will and His ability to bring it about. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish all that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I am of the opinion that our Heavenly Father will not allow the enemy to prevent his will from being established, and that he has a plan to redeem, at some point, even those that fell into the enemy's hand, so that his will as written in his word is established. That plan would seem to involve having our enemy enter God's harvest which is about to be reaped before the time appointed, and causing Satan to become guilty of theft which can now be used in a legal case against him to bring about the outcome that our Heavenly Father desires, so that all of his creation, especially those who were created in his image, can be reconciled with him. This legal case is based on what is written in Proverbs 6 verse 30 to 31, where the following judgment is pronounced over those who steal. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house. Over the past year, Satan has stolen close to three billion people by marking them with his mark before the appointed time arrived for him to do so, and therefore this passage from Proverbs applies to him, and he will have to give back sevenfold of what he had stolen or about 21 billion people at this point, and everything else he possesses. I believe this is all part of God's plan, and this is how we will go about to reconcile all of his creation with him, by having the enemy pay back sevenfold of that which he obtained illegally. Many have accused me of being a universalist, but I am simply pointing out to you what the word of God shows us with regards to our Heavenly Father's will, and that his will is to reconcile all of his creation with him that Jesus' blood even washes away the sins of the whole world, and that he will use the sevenfold restitution penalty, as described to us in Proverbs, against our enemy to accomplish his will. What about everything written in Revelation, with regards to those who have taken the mark, and who will suffer eternal torment as a result, and all those who die without salvation? 
What about the ABCs of salvation? And does this mean that people can simply live as they want to because everyone will eventually be saved? From what I understand and in my opinion, a similar situation will be brought about in connection with all the judgments that are pronounced over sinners in Revelation and other books as we saw applied during the times of the Old Testament. What do I mean by this? If Jesus did not shed his blood for us on the cross, what would have been our standpoint towards salvation today? We would all still be sacrificing animals to atone for our sins. But why are we not all still following those instructions that were provided to us in the Old Testament? Are they now null and void? God provided something much better through Jesus and that provision fulfills all the requirements of the Old Testament. And it imputes Jesus' righteousness to us if only we believe in him. When we consider the legal case that is now being established against Satan, if Satan followed the instructions in God's word with regards to the harvest and how a harvest should be conducted, all the judgments that were pronounced in the word of God over those who are destined to spend eternity in hell as Satan's legal property would have applied. However, now that the enemy has to give back sevenfold of what he had stolen, those souls that would have been lost to God becomes God's property again, as part of the restitution that the enemy has to make, which may just invoke the cancellation of those judgment over God's creation, especially over those made in his image, that would otherwise have applied to those who had no hope of rescue. Just as in the case of the laws in the Old Testament, it would seem that this judgment against the enemy will also overrule or supersede the judgment over God's people, which would otherwise have applied to the lost if the enemy kept to the instructions in God's word. I hope that makes sense. Now for the amazing bit. A few days ago I was watching a video by Ken Johnson in which he was explaining the Enoch calendar and then I came across the next snippet that I would like to share with you. Listen carefully to what he says and how this ties in with what I have just explained. Also take into account that this was the first time I heard this passage in this specific translation from the book of Enoch. I will also link the video in the description below. But it says... Uh... Uh, the rebellion will manifest in many different ways. So it's probably all of those we're talking about. At its close, the elect righteous of the eternal plant will be rewarded with a sevenfold instruction concerning his creation. And that's been debated a lot of what exactly that means, and it still needs more study. At its close, the elect righteous of the eternal plant will be rewarded with a sevenfold instruction concerning his creation. So in Enoch 93 verse 9 to 10, we read about God's sevenfold instruction that he will give to the righteous concerning all of his creation. And I believe we now know exactly what that means, what it involves, and how that will be brought about. It just so happens that God's word also provides us with a pattern to better understand how this instruction will be brought about. When Jesus died, he went to preach to those in prison who are separated from God by their sins but who believed in Jesus as being the Son of God. And some of these people are described to us in Hebrews 11. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. These people who had faith in the Son of God were freed from a prison that was called Abraham's bosom, or paradise. They were resurrected with Jesus as the first fruits of a harvest that is just about to be reaped. These Old Testament saints who sacrificed animals for their sins did not obtain forgiveness of sins through those sacrifices and were prevented from entering heaven because of the sin that remained against their names, even though they had faith and believed as we do today. I believe the word of God shows us who will be responsible for rescuing the next batch of people from their prison, and we read about that in Matthew 16. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates are a means of protection for those who are behind it. Gates can only serve a defensive role. If the gates of hell are unable to remain standing against the church, 
the church would be seen as the offensive party in this case, and the entity that will attack the abode of the lost, and who will set its prisoners free. There is not really any other way to interpret this passage than to see the church as the attacking force that will break down the gates of hell. We then see how hell delivers up its dead to be judged, and these people are judged only by their works, since they died without placing their faith in the Son of God. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. I think God's sevenfold instruction will be to His church to go and plunder hell and to populate heaven with those who had to be given back to God as a result of Satan's transgression, and that our Heavenly Father will in this way reconcile another portion of His creation with Him. Does this now mean that all of humanity will end up in heaven? It is God's will for all to be saved, if I read and understand His word correctly. But will all have the same position in heaven? No, probably not. Will all arrive in heaven at the same time? Probably not. Those who rejected God out of ignorance or even willingly while they were alive will probably be seen as those who were plucked from the fire, not receiving any rewards or crowns, while those who loved the Lord and who shined His light in this world while they were eagerly awaiting His return will have positions of higher honor in the coming heavenly kingdom. I was just amazed at the passage from the book of Enoch that would seem to address this very specific issue. Next, I would quickly like to look at some interesting aspects with regards to the upcoming feast days. As I have explained in previous videos, I believe Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday to allow for three days and three nights, or at least a minimum of 72 hours in the grave, before his resurrection, which occurred as the sun began to dawn towards the first day of the week, or a Sunday. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it. As such, the only crucifixion date that matches this requirement of the resurrection occurring around dawn on the first day of the week, in the year surrounding 30 AD, is March 23rd of 34 AD, when we look at Torah calendar. This is quite an interesting date because it is also linked to the spring equinox for those who are in the northern hemisphere and was not only marked by a lunar eclipse that occurred on the eve of Passover but it also featured an eclipse of the sun for three hours on the very next day. So very eventful when it comes to heavenly signs associated with the fulfillment of this feast day. As I have explained in earlier videos I also believe that the feasts are related to the pattern of the menorah. That pattern is to have three feasts on either side of the menorah with Pentecost in the middle. There is also a hint in the word of God that the feasts may be fulfilled in the order that is established, moving from the outsides of the menorah to the center. This pattern is also shown to us in the codes that had been hidden in the Torah, where Genesis and Exodus have the letters of the word Torah encoded at every 50 letter in the direction in which one would read the passage, while Numbers and Deuteronomy have the same word encoded at the same interval, but it is encoded in the opposite direction, or reading it backwards. So while Genesis and Exodus point to Leviticus, it would seem that Numbers and Deuteronomy also point to Leviticus based on this phenomenon that our Heavenly Father built into His law. Leviticus has the name of God, or yod heh vav -Hey, encoded in it at a seven-letter skip. And this would seem to be the pattern that shows us how to interpret the order in which the Lord's feasts will be fulfilled. If this understanding is correct, then the feasts should be fulfilled from the outside inwards. And it stands to reason then that the next feast to be fulfilled would be the Feast of Tabernacles. One would then also expect some similarities between the feasts that are first in each of the series that will be fulfilled. I have shown you some interesting attributes surrounding the likely date when Jesus became our Passover Lamb and that it occurred right at the spring equinox. Considering this year's fall equinox, we just happened to have the first day of tabernacles falling on the fall equinox. 
It also happens to fall on a date that has been overemphasized by our enemy through predictive programming, as I have showed in this video a few weeks ago. It is also interesting that Jesus showed us that his transfiguration on the mountain took place during the Feast of Tabernacles, and that Peter was apparently inspired to leave that clue for us when he asked Jesus if he should build booths for Jesus, Moses and Elijah, not knowing what it was that he was saying. That is exactly what we would expect to happen to those who will shine like the stars when the rapture occurs. And it came to pass as they departed from him. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Why do you think that the Bible records the fact that Peter did not know what he was saying when he made this suggestion? Could this be a clue that Peter may have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us another clue as to when to expect our blessed hope? If we are still here after the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, then be ready because the Feast of Tabernacles and the dates associated with it would seem to be highly anticipated by our enemy and point to a time of great change for this world. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you will receive salvation. Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you placed all of your trust in Him to save you from your sins? Jesus shed His precious blood on the cross to set you free from sin, and your sins being washed away and you becoming a fellow heir with Christ as a son or daughter of God is a free gift to anyone who will accept. The only way in which you can obtain this gift is through faith. You cannot earn it, and you cannot pay God back for it once you have it. Would you not accept His gift of eternal life to you today, while there is still time to do so? Do not trust in your own works to save you, even if those works are the works that you do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will receive all the glory for every person that He saved, and we can only offer Him our gratitude and worship.